everyone, I'm Monica and welcome back to my channel, Mooney Reads, where I talk about books and things. And today I have a massive wrap up. Now it took me forever to decide whether I was going to divide this into two videos because this month your girl read 20 books. 2-0, oh, the big 2-0, oh, 20, that's never happening again. So we're clear. I, 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 I don't like, don't know how. No, I do know how that happened. Short books and audiobooks. I endorse it. We're just gonna jump right in, guys, because, like, we ain't got no time, and I'm trying to keep this short, which we know it's not gonna happen, but I'm gonna try, all right? I'm gonna do my best. So let's start with book number one. We have. La Sombra del Viento by Carlos Ruiz Zafón or The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafón. And I gave this book five out of five freaking stars. Also, uh, by the way, I have a lot of chaotic energy happening with me today. Like, mmm. So, I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for this. Anyway. Uh, this book is about a, l a boy whose name is Daniel and he is taken to this library of hidden books or lost books. Oh, the library of forgotten books or of lost books. I don't know what the translation is. But basically, this is a library where books go once they have been forgotten by everyone. And there he finds a book written by somebody named Julian Carlax. And what happens next? is the most incredible adventure, romance, love of books, love of life, love of everything that I have ever read in my life. This book left me speechless. Do you know how hard that is? Do you know how much I talk? Especially to myself. And this book was like... I remember reading this book and at some point I was like, what the, what the, what the frick? What the frick? The characters are amazing, the story is amazing, and also it's so interesting, it's interestingly interwoven and written and it's just, what are you doing that you're not reading this book? Like I don't, what, what, who are you? Why aren't you reading this book? The love in this is really crazy, the plot twists are, there's some plot twists in here which let's just say, whoa girl! I, I, at some point I was like, I can't keep doing this, like I, I can't, I can't keep doing this. The only thing I will say is that this has a very Spanish writing style or like Spaniard writing style where they don't just tell you the name of the street, they tell you the history of why that street is named like that and what happens in that street. And kind of Spanish writers tend to write for Spanish readers. If you're not used to like, for example, I knew most of the streets they were talking about because I live in Spain and I have been to Barcelona where this book is, like, based. So I knew a lot about the places they were at, but sometimes I was just like, I just kind of don't want to know, like, that there was a king that passed through here 500 years ago and, like, he fell down and... There was a pebble in the way and that's and, th and then that pebble led him to his lover and it's like that has nothing to do with the book so that is a thing that spanish writers do but in here i just feel like i didn't care that that was in here because i love this book so freaking much like this was probably my top three books of the month like amazing five out of five stars loved it next next i read the Forest of Fallen Stars by the one and only Elfie Riverdale. Now, I'm gonna start off by saying that it was scary for me to read this book because this book was written by one of my best friends. What if I didn't like it? The good news is I did like it. Now, this is a middle grade fantasy story that I feel when I have children, if I am lucky enough to have them, I want to read to them. It was just a really sweet, quick read. I will say that there are some editing things that I noticed when I was reading it, but overall, I gave this book a four stars. I love the story, and I find myself thinking about the story a lot. So you know that's when a book stays with you. You know that that's something really special, and I think this book is a really special book, especially for younger readers. And Elfie herself says that she has dyslexia, and she wrote this book 
specifically for people that suffer from dyslexia that feel that can't get into fantasy because sometimes the words are just a little bit too much and she keeps it simple on purpose and I feel that it wasn't simple to the point where it got boring I just felt that it was a simple it, it was like a middle grade lovely little book and I recommend that you pick it up definitely go for it child it's great next up what do we have next oh my Oh my good lord. Next, I read Radio Silence by Alice Osman. Now, I'm gonna blame my two-star rating on me for this because I should have read the synopsis of this book before I went into it because I, li li listen, I thought this book was about a girl that really is into a podcast and then somebody that is part of the podcast goes missing and she goes after to find them. That is not what this book is about. This is not a thriller in any way, shape, or form, and that's my fault. And I don't enjoy contemporary books, especially contemporary YA books, which is what this book is. Now, the book itself is fine, but I put my star rating based on enjoyment, and basically, I hated every moment of reading this book. I'm going to have a whole book chat talking about why I don't like to read from teenage perspectives and I promise it's not because I hate teenagers or because I think YA is stupid or doesn't deal with intricate or intense or complex emotions because this book has plenty of that. It's another thing, but that's another video. So I'm sorry, I didn't like it. I know that so many people like it and I have Heartstopper on my list of books to read next month. And I'm kind of dreading it because it was also an Alice Osman book. But I guess I, I know what Heartstopper is and I'm excited for that. So let's hope that I like that one because <laughs> whew, getting through this one felt like right now keeping my neck in the correct position. It was painful. I didn't like it. I just didn't like this book, okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you liked it. I'm sorry if it's your favorite book. I didn't like it. Moving on, next. My Cousin Rachel by the one and only Daphne du Maurier. And all I have to say is Daphne du Maurier has done it again for me. I love this book so much, even if Philip is a dummy dumb dumb. As I said in my vlog where I did, where I read this book and three other books and saw the film adaptations for them, I will link them up in the cards down below if I remember and also if I have time because you guys have no idea how much I'm working lately, like, I think that's why my back is messed up right now. But anyway, Michaels and Rachel tells the story of this guy who was raised by his cousin, not Rachel, his cousin Ambrose. And Ambrose has to go away because he's like sick and they live in like one of those inhospitable parts of England where winter is like now a no-go zone. So in Italy, Ambrose meets Rachel and he Ambrose starts writing letters to Philip, the main character. In the beginning, he's like, oh, I love her, blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, oh, my torment, Rachel, she will not leave me alone. And then at, Philip becomes convinced that Rachel killed Ambrose. But the thing is, the book asks the question, did Rachel really kill Ambrose? Also, Philip kind of starts to fall for her. That's not a spoiler. I promise you that's not a spoiler. That's literally like in the back, like in the in in the synopsis of it. Not synopsis, the summer, whatever. The back flap, it's there. So he starts to fall for her and it just it's one of Daphne du Maurier's like mysteries that I love. That in the beginning you're kind of like, well, okay, this is fine. And then suddenly you're like, what the what the hell? What's going on? So I loved it. I gave it 5 out of 5 stars and this is my second Du Maurier book that I give 5 out of 5 stars to and I have one more and if I give that book 4 stars and above, Daphne Du Maurier is officially one of my new favorite authors. Congrats girl. Next, Next I read Witches, James First and the English Witch Hunts by Tracy Borman and this is a non-fiction account of witch hunts and witch trials and how much did I give this? I gave this four stars and there is a video vlog, a week, no, it's a 24 hour readathon. It was a 24 hour readathon that taught me that I fucking hate 24 hour readathons. But I read this book during that and I actually loved the book. I just 
hate the experience of being forced to read for 24 hours and feeling guilty if I don't so yeah this book is about mostly well the history of witch hunts and why James the first was fucking obsessed with hunting down witches at least in the beginning of this life in the end of his life he's just like well whatever but in the beginning he's really obsessed with it and this is amazing because this tells the story of the flower girls witch trials which by the way i realized that most of the witches that were like hunted had really like nature-based names and that's interesting because usually when we think about like paganism and witches we think about names like how cool would it be to have the last name Moon? Well, like literally somebody was hanged. Not for the last name Moon, but she did have the last name Moon. And well, this is about the flower girls. And they're just a family of women that were ex accused of witchcraft. And the thing about this trial was that it's one of... It's, it's like... It's like if witches went after like a governor's children. Like... It's, they were such a high up nobility family that it's so well known. And it's actually the only mention, they, they get the only mention in the church of witchcraft in England. So if you are into the Salem witch trials, if you are into witches in general, into paganism, I highly suggest you pick up this book. I learned so much from it including that Hollywood has just been steering me wrong the whole time. What the hell? Like, Hollywood, I thought we were friends. I thought you were teaching me actual important historical facts. Who knew? Next. Oh, next up, I read, actually, I read, <laughs> this is like my month of nonfiction reads because the next two books I read are actually nonfiction, and the first one is The Soul of an Octopus, and I think this video is going up after my nonfiction recommendations. And basically, if you know, if you have seen that, then you know how I feel about this book. But if you haven't, I love this book so much that it makes me emotional to talk about it because it talks about animals in a way that I feel we should talk about animals, which is not as like these basically instinct driven non-sentient things but maybe that their sentience is just different than ours and that their intelligence is different than ours and it's so crazy that when this book was published in 2015 we still had that mentality of anybody within the scientific community that says animals have feelings and have thoughts and have emotions and can make connections with humans is basically the laughing stuff of the scientific community so fuck that and this book gives the big finger to that and i love it because of it and i also gave it five out of five stars Cy montgomery is a great writer and i love how she wasn't scared she wasn't afraid to show her emotions towards these animals and show that when you work with animals you create a bond with them and i think a lot of scientists are like no that's not what happens we see them as things because we're not supposed to create bonds and she's like no she literally cries when an octopus dies i also learned that the plural of octopus is octopuses because you can't put an i unless it's like there's a there's a there's a rule for it but anyway octopus and it matches my octopus tattoo i love octopuses i just didn't know as much about them as i do now now just like with whales i'm basically an octopus scientist so i mean <laughs> can we like admire the fact that i'm becoming just a general scientist next up next i read brain on fire by susanna kahalen whose name I learned to say literally like at the end of the video where I read this because this was also part of my book to movie adaptation blind date thingamabob which if you haven't seen I will link up in the cards and down below if I remember because again crazy times so what is this book about? this book is about a woman whose brain starts to malfunction and her life is turned upside down and thankfully as you can see as this was written by her she gets better but she does touch on the point that she was really really privileged and lucky 
to get better. And I feel like there was a missing, like a little bit of missing extra sauce in here about the fact that she's a white woman and if she was like a brown skinned woman, she probably wouldn't have been able to write this book because they would have written her off. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just throwing that out there. But anyway, the book is amazing. I gave it, did I give it five stars? I did give it five stars. I'm, I don't shy away from giving memoirs a rating because I'm not rating the person's life. I'm rating my enjoyment of reading about their life. So yeah, this book is really good. And it's a really good introduction if you are trying to dip your toes into medical writing or medical memoirs. I think this one's really good because this is not written from the eyes of a doctor from, but from the eyes of a patient. The movie, if you saw my vlog, you saw how I felt about the movie. And if you see my face, I think you can figure it out. Next! Next I read In an Absent Dream by Shauna McGuire. And I gave this book four stars. Um, yeah. I, I really, I never know what to say about these books because they're kind of like, they're fine. They're all right. I, I don't get the hype of these being like super amazing books. I just don't get it. They're entertaining. They're definitely entertaining and they do have some hard-hitting emotional aspects about them. But I honestly, if I'm being honest with you, I can barely remember what this book is about. So yeah, uh, I liked it better than the last one. That That's all you're getting from me. I think, uh, yeah, that's all you're getting from me. <laughs> Four stars. It was actually like a three and a half. So, but let's just bump it up to a four. Then I read like the like dark horse of this TBR because I had started to read Solaris a couple of months ago and I put it down because I was reading the audiobook and the audiobook do not recommend. This is like a hard sci-fi about people that go to this planet where everything seems to be going wrong and there's an ocean there that seems to be some kind of life form but we're not sure about it and look this is cosmic horror and if you don't know what cosmic horror is it's basically horror where it's lovecraftian horror so we kind of don't get a lot of explanations for a lot of things and a lot of things are like shapes that we can't explain and, and a lot of that but behind all that it's really a human story of species origin and our relationship with gods in general. And I'm all about that shit. And if you saw, again, this was part of my book to movie adaptation black date project. If you saw, this was like the surprise because both the movie and the book were fucking five stars. I love them. And this book read like the prequel to my all time favorite book, which I never mentioned. I always say my all time favorite book is Dune. But actually that's not true. My all-time favorite book is a book written by a Spanish author that is not translated in English. In fact, it was only printed one time and I own two copies of that first edition copy because I'm just terrified that something will happen to it because it's amazing. And I kind of want to do a project where I translate it to English and just send it to people to read because I have nobody to talk about this book with. It's Nobody has read this book but me. But anyway, we're talking about Solaris. It was great. It was amazing. However, I warn you, it does get bogged down in the middle with like pseudoscience kind of numbers that don't make sense. You can just skim read that. That's what I did anyway. And then we get to the biggest disappointment of this freaking TBR and that is The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. I hated this book so much and it's not because the book is bad it's because the book reminded me so much of frankenstein and i don't like frankenstein that i was like oh god this is like boring and bad and i don't get it and then in the end the payoff is like it's a uh, i don't know I, in, in my in my personal opinion watch the musical i'm sorry i didn't like the book I really wanted to like it. I really tried, but I just couldn't. It was way too melodramatic for me. And um, I'm not that melodramatic. And also it was just a love story. Well, and it wasn't just a love story, but it was a love story. 
And look at me, I, I don't enjoy love stories and this one was extra, like super extra. There's a point where like somebody like somebody's love interest gets kidnapped and I'm like, uh, yeah, you damsel in distress, this is stupid. And then somebody else is like, yeah, I didn't enjoy this reading experience. So I gave this three stars. And honestly, that was me being nice because again, I give star reading not based on the merits of the book or the like literary proneness, proneness, proneness. Is that a word? You know what I mean. The li literary merits. There you go. Gosh, again, English teacher. Love it. Love that for me. But anyway, I don't give star ratings for literary merit. I give star rating for how much I enjoyed it and I enjoyed this like not a lot. There were parts that I was like, oh, that was interesting. And then there were parts where I was like, Ugh, when is this going to end? Can it please end now? Next, I read Nevermore by Jessica Townsend, The Trials of Morgan Crow, who I called Morgan Crow in my TBR. I'm a mess. Five out of five stars. Freaking love this book. Stop comparing this to Harry Potter. Stop it. This has not got nothing to do with Harry Potter. Like, I don't even know where to begin, except that there's magic and children that might go to a magical school because it doesn't even have a magical school. It just has like a society in it. So I, why do people compare this to Harry Potter? This is freaking steampunk magical middle grade. And if that doesn't make you want to read this book, I'm not, I'm done with you. So yeah, five out of five stars. I loved it. I loved Morrigan. I love the adults in the book. I love the twist. I got a little bit confused. Like there's parts, there's a part in the book where I was like, can we just get a move on? You know, I just want to get to the trials. But the book was whimsical and lovely and everything I needed after reading Phantom of the Opera because I was just like over it. And I loved it. All right, up next we have Beastly Bones, a Jacoby story by William Ritter. This is the continuation to Jacoby. And uh, I freaking love this series. This series is like an inconsequential YA series that is just fun to read when you're feeling a little bit down. And maybe I was feeling a little bit down, but honestly, I just wanted to read it because I really like the characters and it was fun. I can't say much about it because then I would spoil the original, like not the original, the first book. But let's just say this is Sherlock Holmes meets Supernatural. What? I love it. It's so good. And the characters are good and fun and it's just one of those things that you read knowing that nothing bad can happen really. Like nothing truly bad and it's fun and uh, you can read this in a day. It's great. I I I endorse this book. It wasn't as book it wasn't as book. It wasn't as good as the first one. The first one was amazing. I think it was suffering from second book syndrome. But I give it four stars because it entertained the heck out of me. Up next, I read Come Tumbling Down by Shanna Wire, and I gave this book four, four? Yeah, four, <laughs> four out of five stars. I actually can tell you what this book is about. This book just wraps up this series really nicely. This book, I can't really say much because I'll just spoil the, uh, the rest of the series and uh, I don't want to do that. But let's just say we revisit the characters that I really liked in the original like book. Like I, I keep saying original in the first book. And uh, let's just say this book talks about sisters and about what it really means to be a monster. And this was the one book in this series that I really, really liked. So I'm gonna, I gave it four out of five stars. It was actually really good. I liked it. Kind of heartbreaking, but in a good way. And I'm so happy to have finished the series. Can we get a hurrah for me? I'm gonna try to insert a sound. Next up, you're gonna start to see a theme right now, and it's that I started to pick short books because I realized at this point in the month, we were like a week away from ending the month, and I was like, 
I could technically read 20 books this month. So I set myself a challenge. And when your girl sets herself a challenge, she meets that challenge. Even if that means not sleeping and reading through students taking exams. So the next book I picked up is this little novella by Oscar Wilde called The Canterville Ghost. And this is about the kind of cutest little ghost you've ever met. And he just wants to scare people and people are just not being scared by him and it's it's an adorable book. It's an adorable book with Oscar Wilde's witty writing and I gave this 3.5 out of 4 out of 5 stars. It was a, it was cute. It was adorable, but honestly after reading the picture of Dorian Gray and knowing how beautiful Oscar Wilde can write this just didn't meet the mark for me that well. So it was still a book that I liked. Um, I want to keep it around because it's it's like, it's sweet. That's the thing. It's sweet. It's a sweet book. I don't know if anybody else will call it sweet, but I'm going to call it sweet. Okay, we're nearing the end. Oh my gosh, guys. Then I read this book that wasn't even on my radar, but I was looking through script and I was looking for books that I could read, like that were under six hours so that I could read them to finish the challenge of reading 20 books and I found I'm thinking of ending things by I believe it's Ian Reed. That's how you say your name. I'm sorry if it's not. This book is wild. This is wild. Okay, this book is this book is a stream of consciousness kind of nightmarish you don't really know what's going on type of book and that shit's my jam. I love that. It's such a weird book. I don't know. I heard that they were adapting it. I don't know how they're going to adapt it, but I, I have ideas. Because I don't know if you guys know that I actually studied film in college. Long story. But I have ideas of how you could adapt it. And, and I think they can do it. And it will be really, really cool. I gave this book four out of five stars. Sometimes I feel like it was trying a little too hard and like kind of spoon feeding you stuff. But in the end, I really enjoyed it. So this book is about a couple. And the girlfriend, who's just called the girlfriend, is thinking about ending things. She just realized that they are no longer really compatible. But she's having a hard time with that and along with that there's the going to his parents house to meet them for the first time and this is just basically the worst time ever to end things with someone but she's 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 kind of decided but then she goes back and forth and then in the end he is a weirdo and leaves her stranded in a high school in an abandoned high school and thing get weird AF. Like, really weird. Well, they're always weird, but like after when we get to the high school, it's like, what? If you like that kind of stuff, read this book. And it's on script, so you can read it on script. Guys, next up I read Binti by Andy Okurafor. Okrafor? I'm so sorry, I'm probably butchering your beautiful, beautiful name. But look, I've I've seen I've seen so many people say that this book is like just this woman being obsessed about mud. And I think if you that's all you got from this book, I I don't know what to tell you because this book is so much more. This book is Afrofuturistic. Basically, what that means is this book in the majority of futurism, we kind of have this idea that all cultures kind of blend and like Africanness gets like sucked out or you know not even talked about and everybody just acts like a white person. And what Afrofuturism is, is that it doesn't erase African culture from futuristic books. And this is a perfect example of that. And I adored it for it. I loved Binti as a character. Um, the audiobook for this is incredible. I actually then read it. Like, I listened to the audiobook and then I read it in physical form just to see how it was. It's a little novella. It's beautiful. It's beautifully written. It's I think the themes of misunderstanding cultures of 
col colonialism, col colonialism, colonialism, and communication, and how there's no right or wrong parties when it comes to war and how racism works and how we might have racism in the future this talks a lot about racism in the future i love this book i i I'm, i just i can't sing enough high praises for this book and when i see people brushing it off as like oh my god this girl's just obsessed with mud it like kind of hurts my heart a little bit i gave this five out of five stars um, I absolutely love it and I, I wish there were more books like that like this that don't erase African culture from futuristic plots because What do we think that we're just gonna like erase it? so Amazing, I already have the two sequels for this and I'm gonna get to reading them as soon as I can All right up next I read Charmed Live by Diana Wynne Jones and this book is about a little girl who's kind of a I'm not gonna say the B word because she's a little girl but let's just say I've never read a more annoying self-righteous spoiled brat in my life and her little brother Eric who is like constantly scared of her bullying and she's a witch and she's a pretty powerful witch and their parents die and she goes to live with this guy named Crestomancy who is supposed to be a very powerful wizard himself and she just keeps like fucking things up all the time and poor cat is just trying to survive his sister's wrath constantly I gave this book three out of five stars and I have made the decision to break up with the D Diana Wynne Jones. I'm sorry, Diana. It's not you, it's me. Her writing style is not for me. I actually DNF'd Howl's Moving Castle. It was just not for me. If you like this kind of writing and if you liked Howl's Moving Castle, you'll like this. But I didn't, so this book is going in the donate pile because I don't wanna keep it around because I'm never gonna read it again. And that's sad because. I really like the cover. Also, if you saw my video of my Bay TBR, this was actually on my May TBR, and I'm kind of glad I got it out of the way because I didn't like it. Next up, we read Coraline by Mr. Neil Gaiman. And let me tell you, it was amazing. I absolutely adored this book. I had seen the movie, and I like the movie, even though it kind of creeps me the fuck out because it's kind of creepy. But the book is so much better. <laughs> can't even the book is so good Coraline in the book is so lovely so adorable if you don't know what this book is about then it's about a little girl who's just not really happy with her family she's having issues her dad kind of works too much her mom is a little bit aloof and she kind of you know she's having the typical problems kids have with their parents where they think they're no fun and they just moved to this new house and on a rainy day, her dad is like, listen, we can't entertain you, find your own entertainment. And she finds this door that leads her to another place where there's another mom and another dad that seem perfect, except they have buttons for eyes, which is the creepiest shit in the world. But it gets even creepier, I'm not gonna spoil it. If you've seen the movie and you think you know what this book is about, you do know what the book is about, but I implore you to read the book because it's so, 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 so good. All right, so I gave it five out of five stars. Oh, and Neil Gaiman is the one that narrates the audiobook, which is on Audible. Not Audible, Scribd. It's on Scribd. I recommend it. I usually don't like when they have music in audiobooks because since I'm listening, it, I'm listening to it at two speed, the music kind of sounds weird, but I think in this book it actually works and he does voices and it's amazing. 100% recommend, 5 out of 5 stars. And then I read my first ever Arthur Conan Doyle, A Study in Scarlet, which is the first Sherlock Holmes book, and I gave this 5 out of 5 stars. Where have I been that I haven't been reading Sherlock Holmes? It's so good. Not only is it so good, but it feels like it could have been written 
today. And this was re written, 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 and this was written in 1887. And the prose and the, the like writing style is fresh and, and like modern. I always thought these books were gonna be a little bit stuffy and stuff, but they're not, they're amazing. And this, this one, is about well they're all about a murder they're murder mysteries but this one what really surprised me about it is that it, it's the stories are divided into two parts first you get how sherlock holmes solves the mysteries and then you get the part of the bad guy and i loved both parts it was great it was amazing i just i can't believe i had never read arthur conan doyle and now I understand so many things and so many references that I had never known came from this man's mind in 1887. And that is what we call a classic baby, when it can t stand the test of time as much as this book has. So, adored it, loved it so much read it and then finally the last book i read this month is the sign of four by author conan doyle which if you remember is another book my husband picked for me to read in may but i realized that this is the second story in the series and this is the first one so i read this and then i was like you know what i'm gonna read the sign of four and i gave this 4.5 out of five stars i must admit that i liked a study of scarlet better but this was still really good. And also, <laughs> can we talk about something? This book straight up starts up with Sherlock Holmes being bored to the point that he's shooting up cocaine. <laughs> the, the 1880s were a wild time, let me tell you. He's just like shooting up cocaine and Watson's like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm bored. And I'm like, Sherlock, baby, read a book or something. <laughs> and then in the end, I'm not gonna spoil what happens, but in the end, he's again like, well, until the next case, I still have cocaine. And I'm like, what? I loved it. I, again, I really enjoyed both parts equally. I like the mystery part and how Sherlock solves it a little bit less than the study in Scarlet, but I actually like the second part more than the second part of study in Scarlet. I really, really liked it. So yeah. That was book number 20. You thought I was done. You thought, gosh, Monica, that was all that you read. Except that wasn't it. I DNF'd the book this month, which I'm really pissed off at. And that is Lovely War by Julie Berry. I'm not gonna get into much of why I DNF'd this book because I think that deserves its own video and I've already bored you for long enough. But let's just say, I DNF'd it at 20% when I read the line, she was not like other girls, but it was written in a way that it kind of like didn't sound like it. But I was already mad at other parts of this book. And then I read that and I was like, we done. So yeah, so in the end, I read 20 books this month, DNF'd one book, and that means that for my TBR takedown project, I get to buy four books, which you think would be really exciting, except that now I have to actually choose those four books, and that has been a subject of anxiety for me. There are so many more books I want, but we'll get to that video when we get to that video. For now, we are done with this wrap up. So, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have read any of these books or if you have any thoughts about what I said about any of these books, please leave them down below because I absolutely love getting comments from you. And just as a reminder, I post videos every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but not Saturdays and Sundays because I actually do need to rest sometimes. I do. It's like a thing that needs to happen sometimes. But... Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sitting through that if you're new. I don't, I, I appreciate it when you guys sit through these really long videos because I know that uh, it would be much easier for me to have split this up into two, but honestly, I didn't feel like it. I have made the executive decision that I make this channel most of all for me, to please myself, to talk about the things that I want to talk about. And if you guys like them, that is just the extra little sauce in my meal of life <laughs> that I need. I am so much more eloquent when I write. You have no idea. 
But anyway, uh, without further ado, thank you so much, and I will see you in my next video. Bye, guys. <laughs> you know, I realized that I always say bye, guys, and then I tell you like something else interesting. At this point, all I have to say is that I have this really, really bad muscle contracture that comes with my migraines, and I can barely move my neck, and it hurts a lot. And yesterday, I took a pill for it that my doctor told me to take. And um, yeah, uh, let's just say I was talking to my husband about the feelings of rabbits, and um, that I feel that rabbits can't express themselves right, and, I, and that that's bad. I was also saying that my cat was glowing because the sunlight was hitting her. So there's that. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video and my chaotic energy and I'm just gonna go now. Bye! <laughs>